we would like to acknowledge that today's panel joins us from the traditional lands of several indigenous peoples. Please take a moment to recognize ancestral grounds and to honor the original elders past, present, and future. We as an organization are committed to work towards more equitable and just practices. I'm going to hand the baton over to our moderator for this event, Alan Maniker, along with our esteemed panelists. I'll be turning my video off at this point, but I'll be on the chat. Um, so if you need to reach me, just chat and I'll respond. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special event. I'm Alan Maniker, a Martha Hill Dance Fund board member and a graduate of the Juilliard School Dance Division. The Martha Hill Dance Fund is proud to present this panel, which I will moderate, reminiscing about Martha Hill. Please feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat, as Beth mentioned, and we're going to try and answer them all. So first, I have to make some introductions. And I'm going to say flat out that it was a difficult task to edit down the bios of these enormously accomplished people to only a few sentences. So do please forgive me for any omissions. And I'm actually going to begin by sharing my screen, which I'm going to do now. So Martha Hill was an almost larger than life personality. She was a legendary teacher, educator, administrator, artistic director, and a visionary for dance as a performing art. A 1929 member of the Martha Graham Dance Company, she went on to become the chairman of the dance department at New York University and simultaneously the Bennington College Dance Department. These were positions she held from 1932 until 1951. She was the founder of the School of Dance at Connecticut College in 1948. And the summer program she began there at Connecticut College grew into what we know today is the American Dance Festival. She was the founder of the dance division at the Juilliard School in 1951 and remained its director until 1985. She passed away in 1995, just short of her 95th birthday. The Martha Hill Dance Fund continues her legacy forward. She was my teacher, mentor, and supporter. I, along with many others, loved and admired her immensely. She had the ability to launch careers support and promote artists, organize dance departments, and facilitate almost anything. Today, Sylvia Waters, hopefully, Janet Soares, and Daniel Lewis are here to reminisce about Ms. Hill, a most remarkable woman. Sylvia Waters received her bachelor's degree in dance at the Juilliard Schools. Subsequently, she danced with the companies of Hava Kohab and Donald McHale. She appeared in the CBS television production of They Called Her Moses. In 1968, Ms. Waters joined the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. In 1975, Mr. Ailey personally chose her to become artistic director of Ailey II, a position she remained in until stepping down in 2012. Currently, she leads the Ailey Legacy Residency and is artistic director emerita of Ailey II. Daniel Lewis graduated from the Juilliard School in 1967. He is perhaps most known for his work with Jose Limon. From 1962 until 1974, he danced with the Jose Limon Dance Company. He served as acting artistic director of the company with Limon's death. From 1984 to 1987, Mr. Lewis was assistant to Martha Hill and had been a member of the Juilliard Dance Faculty since 1967. He was an adjunct Professor, oh, hooray. Hi, hey, Sylvia. Oh, Sylvia. <laughs> hooray, hooray. Okay. Hi, Sylvia. So he was, he joined the New World School of the Arts in Miami, Florida in 1987 as founding Dean of Dance. He recently published his autobiography, Daniel Lewis, A Life in Choreography and the Art of Dance. Janet Soares received her training from the Juilliard Division in 1962. She danced with the Juilliard Dance Theater, joining Juilliard as part of the dance composition faculty upon graduation. While working at Juilliard, she joined the faculty of Barnard College in 1963. She was also a member of the Limon Company. She holds a doctorate from Columbia University in Arts and Education and is the author of, among others, Louis Horst, Musician in the Dancer's World in 1992, and Martha Hill in the Making of American Dance. 19, 2009. She is currently Professor Emerita of Dance 
at Barnard College, Columbia University. So welcome everyone. And Sylvia, I'm thrilled that you're here. I made it. You made it. Okay, good. So I'm curious. I'm curious who who was the uh, who was the first among us at Juilliard? And since you were all my teachers, I know that I believe I was the last from 74 to 77. It must so, have been me. What? Me. I think I came, I, I came as first year in 56. Yep, I'm 62. I, left, I graduated in, 50, in 61, as Liz Bergman will say, well, then Jana went and got pregnant. Uh, because, so I was pregnant after my third year. I took a semester off. I really didn't take a semester off. I was pregnant and I was still uh, doing work with Louie and so I was really a five-year student. Uh-huh. And Daniel, 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 you were there at what years? 62 to 67, 50, also a five-year student. Were you what? a five-year too, Danny? I was we a five-year student because I was touring with the Limon Company so much. I had to catch up on work all the time. Right. How, but how I actually, you? in my fifth year as a student, I started teaching. How about you, Sylvia? What years were you there? I started in 57. I was supposed to graduate in 61, but there were some complications, which I won't go into now. But uh, I had finished all of my uh, credit courses. I'd finished all of my work, but I'm, I graduated in 62. I never attended that graduation. Ah. Got, got it. So I'm curious, was there a difference in the early 1950s Martha versus the Martha of 1980s? Oh yeah, I, 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 we didn't call her Miss Hill. We called her Martha Hill. She was the second Martha. I mean, and she, and so it always amuses me when I see the Miss Hill because I never called her that. Did uh -huh. you Sylvia? Called her Miss Hill. You I called her Miss Hill? Hill? I don't know why I was doing Same thing. It. You too? Yep. Because I know that, well, when she, when she talked, she always said that she was always referred to as the big Martha versus the little Martha because she was so much taller than Martha Graham. <laughs> but so she wasn't always Miss Hill. Well, for me, she was always Martha Hill. Uh-huh. Well, we, I want to, you know, so I want to tell you. It was you always, some, Aunt, it was Tudor. It was uh, Doris. It, 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 I mean, you know, it was Jose or Limon. Uh, it, it was Alfredo. It, no, Alfredo was always Corvino, I think. Wasn't he still yet? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, everybody was Miss or Mr. to me. Uh, that's <laughs> how I was brought up, and that's the way. I thought in these very formal situations, which Juilliard was to me, um, everybody was Miss or Mister, except right. people near backs. Uh -huh. yes, well, I wanted, you. you know, I wanted to tell you, you know, before I solicited uh, from my classmates some of their reminiscences, and this one came from Jack Waters. I'd like to read it to you and then hear your oh, reaction. Jack Waters. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's here listening. In contrast to the casual manners of the 1970s, she complicated the notion of American modern dance's development as an intimate and familial legacy. At the same time, she reinforced the art as a passed down form, word to word, body to body, from generation to generation. As pupils, we commonly address some of the most legendary respectable, and even intimidating personae on a first name basis, whether living or dead. Anna, Ethel, Jose, Martha Hill was almost always spoken of and to as Miss Hill. Ah, uh, interesting. I don't know what my problem was. <laughs> Do you think it mattered to her? Well, I think, I think I was, see, I was on the faculty like as soon as I graduated and I think I maybe knew her more intimately than others. I, I, uh, June Dunbar, who was her assistant, uh, maybe that was 58, uh, went to Europe for the semester. So I, I took over for June. And then when June, when Martha Hill went to Brussels, I became the assistant to June Dunbar. So I, I think maybe in 
being around the office and being sort of a little more intimately uh, connected to her on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe that was different. Mm. So I was curious, uh, Danny, do you have a recollection of the very first time you encountered Miss Hill? Yeah. I was Tell at us Graham, about it. I was at the Graham studio taking a Graham class and I had in my dance bag, which was an attache case because I never had a dance bag, wanted to be a businessman. And I had a letter from the US government from Uncle Sam drafting me into the army. And Herb Millington, some of you might know who Herb Millington was, a great pianist at the Graham studio and at Juilliard, recommended I go to Juilliard and get a four year deferment. So I walked that day from the Graham studio to Juilliard on Claremont Avenue, walked in, noticed her office was just off to the left, knocked on the door, went in and there's Martha. I said, hi, I'm Daniel and I need to get into the school right away. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and this was early September. I think school hadn't started yet. It was gonna start in a couple of weeks or something. And there was one more audition and with her bun hanging off to one side, I went to the audition, got a full scholarship, and from that day on, Martha and I were pretty much friends. I had no qualms about walking in the office and saying, hi, Miss Hill. But I, I always said Miss Hill. She uh -huh. would tell me Martha. Call me Martha, but I always called her Miss Hill. It took me a long time to stop calling her Miss Hill. Interesting. How about you, Sylvia? Well, I always called her Miss Hill, and I, I had a very amicable relationship with her. When I first, uh, I, I was taken up to Juilliard uh, by a friend of mine who wasn't studying dance anymore, but she thought it might be a place that would be good for me. I was at the new dance group and a lot of little small studios all over New York. And it was my last year of high school. And she took me there. And once I saw the, the, uh, the students, everybody in black, everybody had a bun. I mean, it was all so organized and so um, pristinely beautiful. People moving together like one body, one breath. And uh, Miss Hill took me to see some of the other classes, the music classes as well. And then I had a little meeting in her office with her and she gave me an application and uh, told me when the audition was and I followed through and I, I was accepted. So, Wonderful. Yeah. How about you, Janet? Well, I, I, I guess I would have to say uh, her sitting on the panel at the audition, in my audition. And I think she, uh, they asked me what my music was and I said, well, I brought my own pianist. And they all sort of gasped and I was like, Whoa. so I have to get the stage manager to move a piano because I had a friend who was playing Chopin for me as I was dancing. And so that was sort of a disturbance. It was like, <laughs> what do you mean you brought your own pianist? <laughs> and and uh, then then after that, my first day of, of Juilliard, I can tell you that, that when my dad came to find me, uh, uh, he was pretty much in a panic and he met a woman in the hallway and he said, I have three questions. Where is Martha Hill? Where is Janet? And where is the men's room? And, uh, and Martha said, uh, I am Martha Hill. Janet's in a, uh, being tested for music and the bathroom is down the hall. <laughs> so a font of information. Yeah. Well, so my We're very together my, and she was so beautiful she was always meticulously dressed uh she she uh uh in in i think well gee she was only 56 when i knew her when i think about it i guess i considered her old <laughs> but uh it it she had a, an extraordinary extraordinary appearance of uh togetherness, I would say. Yeah. Mm. So I also have a story because mine also revolved around my audition and I arrived at the Juilliard School and got in the elevator. It, Lincoln Center was where I was I first uh, encountered Juilliard and from the back of the elevator I heard this voice <laughs> and I thought and any one of you that know Miss Hill know that voice and there are hundreds of people to this day that still imitate it. I won't do it here. 
I thought, who on earth could that voice belong to? It was so astonishing. And there, of course, I went upstairs, changed, and went into the studio, and there she was at the center of the table. So I met her voice before I actually met her. So it was pretty remarkable. Um, I want to read something else that came from another classmate, Anne Crossett. Uh, I don't know uh, if you all know, but uh, Anne was a classmate of mine and she went off to Denmark and uh, she was actually uh, knighted by Queen Marguerite of Denmark. So I believe technically she's Lady Crossett. And Lady Crossett wrote, in the period of establishing Company B, the radical youth company for the Royal Danish Ballet, not one day passed without her for me. Is the role model of a woman standing tall while intelligently smashing brick walls and rebuilding institutions for dance, I found myself often asking, hmm, how would Martha deal with this rather awful situation that I find myself in today? Mm. So with that, I ask all of you, is there a lasting piece of advice that Miss Hill gave you that you keep to this day? You wanna start us off, Danny? Sure. There's lots of them, but I, I picked one that I think it's loyalty. If you were loyal to what you believed in, you were good. Um, and more than just anything, any idea, a person, a place, anything that you chose to do in your life, you had to be loyal to it. You also have to be loyal to other people. Uh, to give you a simple example that has nothing to do with dance, when she came down to New World to look at the program, um, my ex-wife was still teaching for me. And she said, what is she doing here? She should be in another state. <laughs> and I had no problem telling her that at the same time. She really believed in loyalty. I think it's what she liked about me so much. I was loyal to Anna. I was loyal to Hannah. Uh, I was loyal to Jose. Uh, I really believed in what these teachers had and I kept them in my heart very dearly. How about you? How about you, Janet? Well, that's funny because I just wrote down that what were the two things that I would say to describe Martha? And I'd say the first was was uh, longevity. After all, you know, Doris died young, Jose died relatively young, so, and she, this longevity meant that she was literally in that job until she was eighty-five. Can you believe all of us staying in our job till eighty-five? And it was, and then they had to practically drag her out. They didn't, they just moved her to an office upstairs. But, uh, and then the second thing was, would be loyalty. And I think that that loyalty started as early as working with Martha Graham. And I think in her heart of heart, she was loyal to the Graham Corps. Uh, and uh, if it was Paul Taylor out of that, if it was, um, um, Casico out of that, I, I always felt that that was very important to her. I think in her heart of hearts, that that dedication she learned early in the Graham studio, and I think that that is is the one thing that she held on to in in terms of her um, uh, aesthetic, yeah, and her her being. Mm -hmm. Uh, so before I ask you, Sylvia, I want to interject one thing because you mentioned her retirement. And I've told the story before when once I was talking to her, uh, we were talking about retirement in general. And I said, well, Miss Hill, she, I, uh, I, I said, she, she actually said to me, well, I retired, dear, but I, I had no idea it was going to be so soon. <laughs> and I said, well, how old were you, Miss Hill, when you retired? She said, 85. And I thought, well, okay. So with that, Sylvia, do you have a piece of advice she gave to you that you remember? Uh, she gave me sound advice on a number of occasions. Um, but it was always kind of mystical. Uh, upon my graduation from Juilliard, I was in her office. She took my hand and in my palm, she made a little uh, circle. And she was encouraging me to apply for a Fulbright to study Indian dance in India. 
And I said, well, you know, I didn't want to be so far away from home at the beginning of my career. She said, well, you have such wonderful hands. I really think you should put them to use. I said, well, I really want to dance with my whole body. I want to dance here. <laughs> so she circled my palm and she said, well, you're going to have a very circuitous route in your career. And I thought, well, she must be some kind of soothsayer or something. She knows something. And a couple of years after that, I ran into her on the 7th Avenue subway. And Janet has heard this story a couple of times. And she asked me what I was doing. I said, well, I'm working with Donald McHale and I'm working with this one and I'm doing that. She said, you need to get with the Alvin Ailey company. You need to get with that company that company is going to be the company, especially for dancers of color. You need to get with them. I said, well, I'm doing this. She said, do you, are you hearing me? I said, yes. And she, as she got off the train, she said, and keep taking your ballet and got off the train like that. <laughs> and uh, it, it happened uh, several times that I would have joined the Ailey Company for one reason or other, but I finally did in 1968. And that was in 1963 when she told me that. Years later at a reunion at her house uh, where she introduced me to lentil soup, I reminded her about that meeting. She had no recollection. She said, really? I told you, I said, yes, you did. <laughs> you absolutely <laughs> did, yes. Did she make that lentil soup? Oh, yes, she did. Wow. And she gave me the recipe. And she gave me what was left over to take home. <laughs> yes. I've been eating lentil soup ever since. Because for her, she always had the seniors to her house uh, for a little brunch kind of a thing. And her thing was always making egg foo young. Yep. In that little tiny postage stamp kitchen of hers, she made egg foo young. But before we leave that, I, wanted, I want to share the advice that I carry with me. And she always told me that if the cho choice between A and B is very difficult to make and you're going back and forth and you can't think of which one to make, she says that it can't be much different. So choose mm. either one. Mm. And I've always kept that in mind as I, if, I, if I've ever had something that I really find very difficult to come to an answer to. She, there was something else, Alan, that I've, I'm thinking about I couldn't believe that she was, I think I was asking her about going on and getting a master's or whatever, and she said, do it. She said, it doesn't even matter if you're signed into one course, it's the, it's the idea that you, you intend to do it. And uh, then I went on to get a, get a doctorate, but it, she, she said that in her career was important, that she realized she had to keep taking her academics so that so that she could work in uh, higher education, mm. and I, I always and she said she kept shaking her head and saying I can't believe in this day and age that we still need uh, degrees as dancers. Mm. And the funny thing, it seems like it's even more important. She thought it would be much much less important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that uh, what you did professionally would would. And it did matter. It, when we all graduated from, from Juilliard, we were all into uh, uh, higher ed dance departments. You know, nobody, we just, she recommended us and they took us, you know? Yeah, but nowadays you need that degree. Yeah. And how are you? Yeah. Hmm. But Martha, Martha always tended to peg people into certain roles, you know, she would, she would decide whether or not you were a performer, a choreographer, a teacher, and man, you could not change her mind once that was pegged, you know, what she had you pegged for. So I'm curious, did she get it right for all of you? Did she get it right with you, Danny? She got it absolutely right. She knew me and technology. She was pushing me in those early days to do things with different kinds of technology. Um, she knew I was a leader somehow because she kept telling me I need to go out and change the world. And she kept offering me jobs in Australia, <laughs> jobs in Ohio, jobs everywhere. It wasn't until New World came up that she said, you've got to take this one. Because it was a new school with new ideas and do it your way. And she sent me off to 
Florida to audition, I was had no intentions of taking a job. But I, all of a sudden I realized I have the opportunity to do what she's done three or four times. Start something from the beginning and take it through to the end. Did, did you seek her advice as you were setting it up? Well, let me, I'll tell you the story. I brought it down to see the school. I showed her around. I, showed her, I sat her down at the desk. I said, I took out my curriculum. I said, why don't you look at this and tell me what you think? You know best, Danny. <laughs> she wanted nothing to do with it. She said, I knew how to do it, and I should do it my way. Wow. She was right. How about you, Sylvia? Um, did she have you pegged? Oh, she did pretty much. Uh, she knew one of my frustrations at Ju the early Juilliard was there was little to no performance experience. And I believe, I believe very much that a dancer um, in training should have some performing experience, but there were, there were hardly any opportunities for that. So consequently, I worked a lot uh, with companies like Donnie's company, Donald McHale, and Hava Kahav, and or whoever was doing a piece somewhere. And it was in all of my after school time and on weekends. And she cautioned me many times. She said, now you have to be careful. You don't take on too much. You know, you're doing too much. You're going to bed at midnight, you're getting up at seven. And uh, even one time she gave me permission to have a leave of absence to do a television show with Donald McHale, which uh, I really felt very special to, that she allowed me to do that. I think it was for two and a half, three weeks. Uh, so she was, I think she did have it pegged. She, she got it, yes. And uh, when I performed with Ailey, well, I stayed with Ailey, uh, over 40 years. I mean, I'm still working with the organization, but she would come to performances and she would come backstage. And, uh, and that voice, I could hear that voice immediately <laughs> at City Center. And I would go and rehearse some of the alien works at Juilliard. So I, I think she did have me pegged. Mm. Right. How about you, Janet? Well, yeah, she, she definitely, knew what she wanted me to do. Uh, and I was the good little tutus and did it. <laughs> and uh, uh, she wanted me very much to stay uh, as assist, become assistant to Louis Horst and take care of Louis. And, uh, and I, it pained me because I really wanted to, to go on tour uh, with the Limon company, but she had, she figured out how I was staying in the city and I was going to stay with Louis. And that, but, and, it, and she saw me as somebody that was going to uh, direct things, and she was right about that. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, and I don't know why, and I saw myself as a dancer choreographer. Uh, she didn't pay much attention to my choreography. She would come see something here and there, but she didn't, and, you know, it was always Danny or Casico or Anna. It, she knew who, who she wanted to put on stage. And uh, so she didn't see me as a choreographer. And mm. that was very, um, it didn't mean I didn't do it, but, uh, and I, I think that she saw others of us uh, that had, you know, like Francine, and Francine that's on, uh, on the web here and uh, Diane sending them off to Australia. She saw them as, as uh, not just a dancer, but someone, someone who would really make a mark somewhere else. Uh, in, mm. And she was into spreading that all uh, uh, dance uh, around the world. Same thing with Carl Waltz. Can I add something to that? Yeah, I was, Please. A, I was at an audition and this one young lady, uh, you may have even been there, Janet, this audition, uh, was not a great dancer and self and Draper, Ethel, we all rejected her. And when we gather up the papers and Martha look at her, she says, you're all crazy. This girl is talented. She can choreograph. You're going to take her. And she took her pen and changed all of our score. On the other hand, though, she could be very harsh if she felt that someone did not belong mm -hmm. as a dancer. And I do remember her saying once, it does nobody any good to encourage someone who has no future. Now, I don't think that that's a position that can be taken today. 
Uh, but, you know, we're talking about 50 years ago. Yeah, but she also had an alternate. She would say, this isn't for you. And we generally recommend something else that they could do or where their talents lie. And I, I think you have to remember that we were a pretty ragtag group. I mean, it wasn't like Sylvia. When Sylvia showed up with a high school with Dudley and and uh, uh, no. uh, and uh, Bill Luther, and I mean, it was pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, and that was that was an amazing group. We were pretty ragtag. I mean, I. I I don't think it was so hard to get into Julia in those early days. Do you think, Sylvia? I don't know. I don't know well, you, I'm but you guys were, were talented. You, you were just terrific. Well, I felt in good company uh, when I was auditioning. I was as scared as anything because I didn't go to performing arts. They did. I met Bill and Dudley and Chaco and Harriet. I met all of them there at my audition at Juilliard. So I was really feeling great about getting in, you know. Um, I, I felt in very good company. And, and that was a very, that was really a, an incredible group. That was when we really, you really had, uh, had dancers. <laughs> and Cora Khan was there yep. at the time. Mm. So I'm curious, what, what ability of Miss Hills did you admire the most? Well, Mr. Tudor used to always call her the solver of the universe, that she mm. could fix anything. Um, I, I don't know, I just found her always very encouraging and willing to listen. She didn't always agree, but she was willing to listen. I think one time I got on her nerves really bad. I really upset her. It was her dance history and criticism class, which I, I expected to be a fantastic class. But I didn't learn anything in that class. I mean, very often she wasn't there. And when she was, she talked about square dancing. And she assigned us um, the Isadora Duncan autobiography, My Life. And I had some very negative things to say about it at the time. It was just so over the top. She was such a, she was such a dramatic person, such a... You know, it was just too much for me. And I, I criticized her. It, had I known more about her, had I learned more about her in that class, I, I probably would have appreciated her more at the time. I mean, I did learn later on, but Miss Hill was visibly upset with me, visibly upset. And she said, mm -hmm. you don't understand. I said, mm -hmm. well, this lady is over the top or something like that. <laughs> But uh, she, we, we got it together after that. And I still have the very same book. I, I looked at it the other day. I said, you know, I'm going to try to read this again. <laughs> and see if I feel the same way, you know. It's interesting, Sylvia. That course developed over the years. And when I took it, we called it the gossip course. Oh, okay. I told you all these stories about it. Everyone in the dance world, who they were sleeping with, what they were doing. It was a oh, I, I didn't even get the gossip. I you didn't, didn't get, get the gossip. You, you lost out. <laughs> yeah, it, she surprisingly had little interest in teaching dance history. Yeah. It was fascinating. She would have us do projects. Uh, I, there was one project. Uh, uh, and my project actually was to, to write up uh, modern forms. For, with, and interview Louie, and, and that was just before her book came out. So that it was very useful information for uh, uh, Carol, who was who was making, who was writing, actually writing the book at the time. So I, th there was an ulterior motive to much of what she was doing. And it, I would say the one thing I learned from her, which I, I don't know that I do it very well, but I was always amazed at how she memorized names she knew names and she met somebody and she and she always deferred she didn't it wasn't about her it was always a, she wanted to know who you were what your name was uh, and then the conversation usually uh focused on the person she was talking to yeah Janet, I, I think that was really a remarkable yeah. uh, ability i was going to say the same thing about names and i'll tell you a story that just blew my mind when she came to new world I decided to do a public um, event where she would speak about her life. 
and we, it was in the paper because you know she was a famous woman. And all these old retired gram dancers showed up. I must say at least 15 of them. <laughs> I didn't know them. So they came in, they're all sitting down. They were, well, Martha gets up and she looks like, Gladys, how are you? Mildred, <laughs> I haven't seen you in 50 years. She knew all of their names 50 years later. I can't remember someone I met yesterday. <laughs> She's amazing with that. I mean, that's really probably the greatest ability she had. I, I also was, I've watched her very closely. She never typed. She always hand wrote everything. She had a huge Rolodex that if you could copy that, you would know the every everybody's telephone number in the whole dance world. And, oh my God, she and, used to use those legal size yellow pads. And the, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing. And I think she also, uh, knew how to keep secrets. Yeah. She, she, I think she certainly had an agenda, but she knew how to keep, she was loyal, but she knew how to keep secrets. Mm. And I don't know that writing. that came, came Sorry. from her own experience with Lefty and, uh, and so that anything sexual or who you were sleeping with or, or who you were dating or anything like that, she would, that was your business. She, she really didn't, go there. She mm. didn't care, care about your sexuality. She didn't care about, uh, she didn't worry much about where you were living or how you ate today. Uh, she was really, her eye was on the prize for all of us, I think, in a remarkable way. Yeah. I, I want to add something to that. The way it worked at, New, at Juilliard was she would write a letter on this long pad, give it to Mary Chetik, who would type it up, Mary Chetik would give it to her. She'd mock up what she uh -huh. typed up, give it back to her. Mary Chetik would retype it. She'd give it back. She'd mock it up one more time. You know, thank God for computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary typed the same letter at least four or five times till it was exactly the way Martha wanted to say it. I, rem I remember her, uh, uh, somebody asked for, a, a, when I was in the office uh, for another letter of recommendation, I said, oh my gosh, how many letters of recommendation do you have to write? I can't believe all these people are asking. And she looked at me and she said, how many do you think I've written for you? I was like, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I just sent the letter of recommendation she wrote for me to get the job at New World to my library up in Gainesville. Uh, I found it. It was well, a good letter. Well, let's, let's talk about Mary Chuddick for a minute. <laughs> who's, who's got a good story? No. No good stories. He held the office together. That's for sure. She, she ran the office. Yeah. But I used to love. And you know, love... I think Martha always had. It, she had uh, uh, Mary Jo Shelley. She always had somebody doing that, and in funny ways, it was Danny and Janet. We were doing that in our little ways. You were doing. Yeah. We had our things. We did for her. You did we the tech stuff, and Janet did the the um, the workshop program stuff, you know, we had our categories. She, she knew how to delegate what yeah. needed to be done. But uh, if you want one about Mary Chetik, I can give you one. Martha, okay. As Janet said, Martha really didn't care who we were with, didn't care who you were dating. Mary Chetik did. Yes. So me, you shouldn't be sleeping with that girl. I got it from Mary Chetik on a regular basis. So for anybody that doesn't know, Mary Chuddick was Miss Hill's assistant. And in my years, she would, we would, there would be a student at the reception desk out between their office. They never talked on the intercom to each other. They yelled through, they just yelled at each other. Martha, Martha, what do you want, Mary? What do you want? You know, and that's the way they would communicate. It was really very funny. And, you know, Mary being of a Russian uh, background, if she was ever frustrated with Miss Hill, she would say, oh, Bozhemoy, right? Do you remember her? She, Bozhemoy, which is Russian for my God. Well, she, she, say, I, oh. she first came to the old school on Claremont, she came and she replaced somebody with, oh my heavens, who is that? She had a, a behave. It was like, whoa. And, but she could type fast. And so Martha said she'd be perfect. Yeah. And uh, then she stayed with her 
all through all through uh, the new school at Lincoln Center. Uh, yeah. And, well, and, beyond that, almost up to where she retired. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But my, but once I said, I think I must have said to to Mary, oh, how do you stand it? And she said, listen, she said, I had a boss before Martha that was the boss of all bosses. I know how to handle it. So she had had, had an experience of a really tough boss. So she, she knew how to handle Martha, she said. She but, did. They were, but they were friends too. Yes. Oh, they were, and I don't and know. Lunch you, together, yep. They were, they were both quite convinced that the lady with the hot dog stand across Broadway had the best hot dogs in the city. <laughs> so I'd be sitting there and it was like from Mary's, Martha, let's go for a hot dog across the street. And off the two would tootle across the street to have their hot dog. Yeah, I saw them argue once over whether you should use Ms, Ms or Mrs. Mm -hmm. That was a big discussion. And? Ms. Martha won, won, uh, won with Ms. 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 It was Martha that wanted Ms. Yep. That's no, no, interesting. I'm sorry. No, it was Mary Chedick that wanted Ms. Martha wanted Mrs. and Mr. She was traditional about those mm -hmm. relationships. Very, very. Actually, I remember in that same history class, she was talking about some event, some uh, social event that she had been to, and she goes, Oh, it was very bright and gay, and we all had a wonderful time. And the whole class tittered when she said the word gay. And she turned to us and she goes, after uh, she said, Oh, another perfectly good word ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I like that story. I'll remember it. <laughs> Did you ever? So, Sylvia, you talked about disagreeing with her. Yeah, just on the one occasion? Uh, pretty much on, that was the only time I really got on her nerves. Uh, she was just always watching my schedule very closely that I didn't uh, take on too much, that I didn't overdo it. And in that last, my last year, uh, I was carrying more academics than I should have. And uh, I was made to, in that last semester before graduation, I was made to drop one course. And I said, do you realize that that affects my graduation? You don't think I'm coming back here for another year? Because I only did it in four years and I'd been going to summer school every year. So she sent me to a Judson Air Bar to discuss it with him. And he said, well, uh, you absolutely have to drop that course. I said, you gotta be kidding. That's the easiest course there is. It's an, it's an art history course and it's a wonderful course. And I can go to the museum all the time. I have a pass for the Museum of Modern Art and it's a great course. Why would you make me drop that course when I'm doing so well in it? He said, those are the rules. And I said, well, would you have bent the rules for Van Cliburn? Mm -hmm. And at that, he thought I was totally in insolent. <laughs> <laughs> Martha Hill would not intervene. So I did not walk with my class. And in the winter of the following year, my father uh, came home one day and he handed me something and it was my degree. In those days, it was a BS degree. I said, oh, right, that's, oh, you want to pick that up for me? Thanks so much. So I think it's um, very sweet that in, 2016, I think it was 2016, I received an honorary doctorate from Juilliard. And I finally got to participate in a Juilliard graduation. And Wonderful. I sat next to Cicely Tyson. Mm -hmm. and wow. Was very honored to do. Yes. Wow. Wonderful. So, well, Danny, did you ever disagree with her? You have to redefine disagree to make this work. Because Martha used me. It's the only time I ever felt used in my life. I was her connection to young people. I felt like they did. So she wanted to hear what I had to say. Whether she agreed with it or not, I wouldn't know. She respected what I said. 
because she had to compare it to her life and how she could make connection to young people. Uh, so we never really disagreed. We just had conversations where she'd go, oh, oh, heard lots of O's. <laughs> and she was able to transfer that so she understood. You know, I always tell the story of her taking me to see um, Lemmings, the, the parody on Woodstock, which is Wood, Woodshuck, I think it was called. And after it was over, I, I figured, what would she know about all these singers that were singing, you know? And she went through them one by one. She knew them all because she listened to all the music we were listening to so she could understand her students better. Hmm. How about you, Janet? Did you ever disagree with her? Well, I think that I teaching choreography composition, I think that Doris and I always worried that there wasn't enough uh, attention paid to choreography to dance composition. It was important to do workshops where we got those students up and you could see them perform. Uh, um, but I, and I don't think we had any argument about it, I, but I do know that I was totally amazed when I did her, the biography on her at, at, when I saw her notes from 1934 when she taught dance composition herself. And they were remarkable, incredible, composition courses full of all kinds of stuff and and I, I think she supported uh, chore choreographers but they weren't the main attention uh, and I think that came of course from uh, of course from Peter Menon and later when it, they, we had to have the balancing look you know we the and but choreographers would come uh, to an audition and Doris and I would ah, we get so excited about the choreography, but uh, we were, I, I knew in, in her heart of hearts, she knew she had to pick the body. Uh, and I think it was coming from, from the Juilliard aesthetic. Uh, but I, I, so I never felt, I didn't disagree with her, but I felt I always had to fight for, uh, for keeping those semesters of dance composition going. Uh. Mm -hmm. So you know, eliminate uh, them, but but I, I don't think that I think that the focus really uh, getting those students on stage and making them look as good as they could look, the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you going to say something, Sylvia? No, I was going to say uh, when I entered Juilliard, I didn't realize how very young the Juilliard dance department was mm -hmm. in the school. And that, I mean, she was the, the one and only. She's the one who created it. She was the one, she was Her Majesty. And, and I didn't realize all of that at the time. I learned that once I left Juilliard and started to look at the Juilliard history and Ms. Hill's um, history with Juilliard and how she had to fight for that department, uh, not only to just be there, but to grow and how administration is so different from teaching in the classroom. I mean, she was the eye for everyone. So it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable what she started and what she created and what she made happen. And many well, times she, she made me a little uncomfortable a couple of times. I didn't disagree with her. Uh, there was a, a couple of students that she didn't feel should complete their course. And I just couldn't be part of, you know, talking to them and I just couldn't do it. You know, right. and I explained it to her and she understood. She said, well, you realize they just shouldn't graduate. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know about that. I'm not sitting on that side of the aisle, but you know. Hmm. So what you say seeds Sylvia very well into this question that comes from the Q&A. Uh, how did Martha Hill respond to the possibility of the dance program at Juilliard being discontinued before the move to, to Lincoln Center? Well, I wasn't there at the time. I had left by that time, but I know she was vehemently opposed to that. 
Right. Janet, you were you were involved in the fight for that, weren't you? Yeah, and I think Danny too, we I mean Tudor designed the sound system for for the studios. All of the faculty, we we all we all went and looked at the different sprung floors. Uh, we for four or five years before the building, as the building was being built, we were uh, she was designing those studios for, for the dance department. It was every indication that we were going there. And I, it, was, it was when everything fell apart and it, it looked like Balanchine was going to take over the studios. It was really something. And, and it was a pretty uh, David and Goliath uh, situation that she actually managed to get her foot in the door at the new building it was just yeah. remarkable uh, because listen everything everybody was against it except and and we had a president that that wanted uh, Balanchine in and the only reason she could come up with which seemed to work they had no argument for was that it was American dance it was for all dance it wasn't just one particular style and Balanchine was one particular style mm. uh, but and then when we got there <laughs> We were in, ended up what Danny with two studios, yeah, two big studios, and one small one, one little funny one that we shared. Yeah, and theater. and her office wasn't the big Balanchine studio on the third floor. She was stuck up in in on the fourth floor and whatever. She just went and put a label on the door and took it. Uh, it was very very tough. And when you think, how old was she then? You know, uh, I mean, by then she was um sixty nine. If I haven't said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, tenacity. Yeah, mm. I don't think people do you... realize just how close we came to not getting to Lincoln Center. Yeah, it it, it could have gone either way, but yeah. she was brilliant when she came up with you have to have dance that represents modern jazz everything along the way because that's what Lincoln Center was all about. Right, and, and that's maybe she had the compromise. She had up William with... Schumann, who was then the president of Lincoln Center. He had moved out of Juilliard. Right. Uh, presidency into and I, that may have helped, but not much. Not much <laughs> I mean, it was it was about money. It, it was, was about where the funding was coming in, and and she had to admit well, uh, I, that unfortunately we weren't very good at raising. I money read all the papers part. that uh, uh, the president wrote, um, Menon, saying that he never, even when he started at Juilliard, I think he and Mary Chetik started the same year, and I went there the same year, sixty two that if there was never funds for it. William Schumann put it in there without any concrete funds to run the dance program. And that's where Menon was with, you know, we just can't afford to take it to Lincoln Center because we have no budget for it. That was his argument. So tell me if Bill, if Bill Schumann had remained president through those 1967 early years at, at, the, at Lincoln Center, would the story be different? I think it would have been different. Uh, totally, it would be a totally different story. Yeah. So it was so the impetus was for nemesis, yeah. the impetus for changing the dance department was coming from Peter Menon. Absolutely. Tough time. And I and you know, they tried to get rid of her. I mean, on and on. Mm -hmm. Every year it would be maybe her contract wouldn't be signed, or maybe and she, one time I remember going in and uh uh there was a, a phone call from uh, not Menon, but one of the one of the deans is saying, "Well, we're expecting that you'll be retiring next year." And she said, "Well, we can't talk about it now. We're busy as, as bird dogs here in this office. We won't. We really can't talk about it now." And then another year would go by, and we couldn't celebrate her birthday either in the office. She said, "We don't want them to know how old I am." <laughs> but so, but so, would she share these things with people? Or was she very quiet about it? These are things that you eventually learned or did she share yeah. her fight with administration with you? During the administration period of changing over, it became a public issue and alumni were involved in writing letters. Um, students were involved in writing letters. I mean, it became a, what they were fighting was uh, Lincoln Center itself and the Balanchine organization, which was a very powerful organization. Sure, sure. I remember actually um, Mr. Balanchine was coming in to the studios one day and uh, to going to SAB and uh, Miss Hill was coming out 
And I was always sort of amazed that they nodded at each other uh, and had a very cordial conversation. Uh, you know, it was almost as if saying, well, listen, it was just politics. Yeah, it was, well, just it politics. was, a, com it was yeah. a compromise. So they both sides won, both sides got what they wanted. Well, uh, and there they had a long history, of course, you know, 19 or the 34, Bennington, uh, Lincoln Kirstein did his first ballet, little yeah. ballet company. She sponsored him at, ba at Bennington School. Can you believe that? Uh, so that they, early on, she was supportive of, of ballet and him and his company. And, and I, I think that they re respected one another, but that didn't, yeah, it was politics all the way. And it was where the money was, was it Rockefeller money? <coughs> Ford Foundation money. Ford Foundation money, yes. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, s several years later, uh, after I had graduated from medical school, uh, Miss Hill was invited to do a panel up at uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine on uh, floors and dancers and feet <laughs> and dancers. And the interesting panel was Kay Mazzo, Madame Danilova, Miss Hill, and Miss Hill invited me. And the point of my story is what seeing Madame Danilova and Miss Hill interact was just two, two great legends, you know, again, nodding very graciously to each other, extending the hand and shaking hands. And uh, they really it had, were very cordial to each other, but it was really just watching this coming together of two titans that was really uh, astonishing to me. She could be that way with many people, I think. Yes. Right. And mm. I, if you if your meaning was she, what was her attitude? I don't think I think she was positive. Maybe we we can do it. We have to look at at the future. Uh, she never gave up on the idea. But I don't think she she didn't talk. She didn't see it as a problem to us. Did she, Danny? I mean, she. We, she knew that she was losing, but there was another way to fight it, maybe. And uh, we'll have to warn the students that maybe they won't be going to the new school. Uh, very cordial but, about it. Yeah. But, mm. you know, after a while, everyone picked up on it. I even mm. remember, a student, what's her name, Risa Steinberg was very yep. involved in getting the word out. And was it her dad's moving company that actually, actually pulled up to the curb and moved her desk over to the other school? I don't remember that, but it's possible. <laughs> I want to. I want to share my screen again for one moment. Uh, let me see. Sorry, one second here, because I would like to just uh, show you something here. Ah. I. There. So. I'm going to oh, look at you. <laughs> start this off with uh, many people uh, called Miss Hill their dance mom, uh, dance mother even. And actually, so there's uh, up in the left, Danny and Miss Hill, and there's Janet and Miss Hill. Um, I'm there in my uh, cap and gown. Miss Hill came to Detroit for my graduation from medical school, and I was really very honored that she did so. And then down at the bottom is a picture of Martha and Vernon Scott, the current Martha Hill Dance Fund president at an event he organized uh, for her on her uh, retirement. And I also want to share with you something that Lance Westergaard said to me. And he was quoting something that Anthony Tudor said to him. Anthony Tudor said, she is the hope for anyone interested in a career in our art form. She is our Statue of Liberty. Uh -huh. oh. I, think that's, I think that's remarkable and right on point. Do you have any thoughts of that? True. It's true. Yeah. What, did, Danny, do, what, do, what, do you know what that picture was from? When was that picture taken? Which one? The one that I just showed of you and Martha. That was taken in a little town just south of Taipei, where there was a museum we went to together. And the picture of Martha with the 
lay around her <clears throat> is a picture I took in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. And how about you, Janet? What was that picture with you and Martha? Uh, that was at Lincoln Center. That's with Selma Jean Cohen. And I think it was, it must have been in uh, 94 when uh, I think I got a, a Bono Prize or something uh, for the Horst book. Uh -huh. uh, it, and uh, I have to say she was absolutely so proud of Dr. Allen. I mean, that was like, wow. <laughs> He's a doctor. She was just so pleased. And she was so proud of Carl Waltz. And she was so proud, you know, with, with establishing the Hong Kong thing and uh, the Hong Kong everything. <laughs> and, and Danny, too. She was really so, once she said to me, um, if I had my life to live over again, I would have loved to have had seven sons. And I, you know, I, I mentioned this to you, Alan. I, I, as, a, as a student, I remember thinking, kind of, there were so many foreign students she was giving priority to, because we had all the, we had people from Israel, from, from uh, 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 Holland, from Australia, we had Greg Cook, we had uh, uh, Nanette Haskell, we had all these foreigners, it's like, what about us, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, it, it, to me, it was, she, she was pretty amazing in her, her reach to make dance international, an international contemporary modern dance, whatever, or her her form of of all dance, uh, concert dance, and I think that it was uh, the spread was really remarkable from from those early times. I think mm. she really uh, she got us all. I think that uh, Diane and and Francine being sent off to Australia uh, for us making connections with uh, 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 London contemporary. Uh, there were always, and people from all over the world were coming to her for advice about what to do and they're looking at the dance department as a model. Mm. Pretty amazing. Okay. Kemi, I, I want to interject one thing here. Uh, I just want to let everyone know we have gone past our hour, but this is such a wonderful discussion. So with our panelists permission, I'll invite anybody who's interested to stay on and we'll uh, continue talking for a bit more. Um, but did you, I want to add, that being said, I want to ask, uh, did she encourage men differently than women? I thought so. <laughs> yeah? Ah, every she, woman thought our, so. Our class, it was it was uh, Jim Payton, Carl Waltz, uh, Myra Nadell, uh, they all got jobs right away as chairs of dance departments somewhere or other. I mean, whoa. Now, Ann and I got, I got fired. She got Temple, you know, Liz, Liz got University of Michigan. But I think we had to work harder for those positions. Whereas she really saw, it was the Bill Bales thing, that she really needed to get men into the dance scene, into uh, positions of authority. I kind of. Yeah, there were also less of us. Yeah, uh, for it was proportionally, it was about the same. Say that but, again. But there were just less men, so it looked like they were all taken care of. Oh, well, yeah, that's I thought true. she was very partial to men to really uh, stack the uh, dance department with more men. Basically, sure. that to encourage. Yeah, bring, men. Good point. My goodness, and some with hardly any training at all. <laughs> you know, like Carl Waltz, hardly any. But I just was interested so, in dance. You know? So yeah. as, as a corollary to that, Sylvia, can you speak to uh, what, you, what her thinking towards bringing people of color into the department were? I think she felt it was a very natural uh, occurrence. Mm -hmm. I never felt uh, there was any, she was partial to one or the other. I mean, there were Japanese also there, you know, um, I, I, I think I think she felt it a very natural thing. I mean, she was very involved in, in uh, things like New, New York State Arts Council and, and lots of things going on in the dance world and involving funding and small companies. So she was very encouraging to uh, dancers of color, very much so. But I, I didn't feel there was a, an, any special partiality to them. It was, it was, it was everyone. 
men especially. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a story back then that the way you auditioned men for dance is you put a mirror in front of the face. If it fogged up, you took them. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something else about, you know, just a sort of enclosure. I remember her saying to me, I was recommending somebody and her, she looked at me and she said, is she family? Is she family? And that sort of spoke to the whole thing of like our, our, our group of dancers, we needed to be for each other. Yep. We, need, we were all family and we needed to support one another. And I, 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 and I was first, well, yeah, she's family. <laughs> but then I thought, is she family? You know, is, is, is this going to be a, a problematic in terms of, of growing this thing called American modern dance? Mm -hmm. um, well, how did she, I want to ask, how did she run the department in terms of relations with faculty? Was she the same way that you said, Danny, you go ahead and do it, you know what you're doing? Was she that way at Juilliard? Or was she more hands-on at Juilliard? I can't ever remember her coming into the studio and watching me teach and then calling me to the office to give me pointers. No. Nope. You know, in a lot of universities now, that they, they do a review of your teaching. We never had that as faculty. She assumed if she hired us to teach, she hired our abilities to do it and yep. never interfered. I, I, would, I would second that. Never came into the classroom. Just trusted what you were doing. I think she also had her, she, she knew if there were complaints, <laughs> you know, then they would come to the office. But I, and that gave us such a sense of freedom and of responsibility because we, she, and, and when Mickey came, Mickey Topaz came and took over, that was the first thing that Mickey did. Mickey came and, and sat in my composition class and I, I freaked. I was like, I, I just couldn't believe it. And you know, I felt I was suddenly being, uh, after all these years, I was suddenly being looked at as somebody that was auditioning for the job or something. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it made me remember how Martha never did that. Never right. did that. She trusted explicitly. She started so, off with a very high bar. I mean, she had the Illuminati of the dance world yeah. as faculty. I mean, you had the, the Graham Company, you had members of the Limon Company, and all of those uh, uh, ballet, Ms. Krask and mm -hmm. Mr. Tudor, Mr. Corvino. You know, she started off very at a very high bar. So in other words, she didn't have to monitor no. because they were of such high quality to begin with. Is <laughs> My Where are we, Danny? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, but, that, but there's something about feeling, feeling the responsibility and the mission, and uh, and and doing your very best. Even the, and she was so loyal. For example, she if you if you had a, 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 you had to be away for two weeks, and she'd figure out how to cover it. If you had to uh, for Jose, if Jose had to go on tour. She figured it out. Uh, uh, and so she made it possible. She also made it possible. We were not making a lot of money, I might add. We were getting 50 cent raises every year from Peter Menon. But, uh, but the, the, we weren't working for the money. But on the other hand, she would make us a schedule where we would be, have three classes in a row. So at least we'd make $150. Uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, if we were at a rehearsal, you got, you got paid for that rehearsal. And we loved going to doing juries because we made so much money because <laughs> we'd be there from, from nine o'clock until six o'clock and we we're paid by the hour. So, I mean, in that sense, and then and that, when Mickey came, that was why I left Julia. I couldn't, she wanted me to teach one day, three days a week. I said, you know, for 40 bucks, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. so, I, so she was very uh, supportive of each one of us, I think. Don't you think, Danny? I was a little different. <clears throat> she actually put me on salary. I got a weekly salary regardless of what I did. Um, she, want, she really wanted me there. 
as much as I, I could. Well, she needed you for, for all the technicians. Yeah, and, stuff and at the same time, when I had to go on tour for three weeks with Jose, it was go. I didn't uh -huh. lose my salary either. The salary continued week after week after week. So there was one question from uh, Therese Capasili that I wanted to get to. Um, I know, th and this is her question, I know through those early years, there were many children's dance classes on Saturdays, including Graham classes with Patsy Birch. Were any of these panelists involved in any of these classes and how long did they last at Juilliard before no longer offered in the dance division? Well, I could, very I, could an I could answer that because I was, I was uh, Patsy Birch's uh, sub when, uh, and uh, yeah, and for, I don't know, it must have been 58, 59, when, when Patsy was busy making Charlie Brown or whatever. And I couldn't believe the class. I think Reed Hansen was the pianist. And they, those, those little eight to 10 year olds, if you if said, and they went, did triplets across the floor. I mean, they were so disciplined. It was amazing. And my daughter, Sabrina, who I think is watching, was one of those students with Patsy Birch. Yeah. And then I also did, uh, it was all day Saturday. Do you remember Saturday? You couldn't use the studios because the kids' classes were happening. And uh, I assisted then Alfredo Corbino in uh, for a ballet class for two or three years. She was good at giving me little jobs to make some money. Uh -huh. <laughs> do you remember that, Sylvia? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, and I think Donya Foya, was she ever there? No, I don't remember her. Do you but remember Earl her? Lang did. She had a children's division for a while, early on. Danya mm -hmm. did? No, uh, Pearl Lang. Oh yeah, Pearl taught the uh, six, taught Graham technique to the teenagers. Right. And then for some reason you're asking, why didn't that go, they didn't go to Lincoln Center at all. Now maybe that had to do with the busyness of, of, uh, of the balancing company and, and uh, I you think know. it also had to do with the Stinkin' Lincoln Center student programs took over. Yeah, well, I, I, I moved into Lincoln Center student programs. First of all, we didn't have enough space, and and all, all those kids from from uh, uh, SAB were coming into the studio. So all day Saturday uh, at the new building. So I think that was out the window for the Juilliard. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we are getting on in time, we have gone on, and I wanna finish with one final thing that I'm gonna ask each one of you in turn. This comes from Liz Maxwell. What is the most important thing for us to tell our 21st century dancers about Miss Hill? Sylvia, you wanna start? Um, well, she was a force, she was a warrior, she was the beginning of all that is there now. Uh, her stamp is very, very much on the Juilliard Dance Department. And I really think that students should, uh, should really research her and what she did in the beginnings of the school. They should know the history of the Juilliard Dance Department. It's a very, very important history. Well, a good place to start is our own Beth McPherson's book and Janet Soar's book. You have two of the authors right here with us. So Janet, you want to tackle that question? Uh, I, I think they should look at her tenacity over from in, in every direction in moving the dance field uh, and being part of the dance field. And then I think what you'd say to students like Martha Hill, make it happen. Make it happen. You can do it. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, and she was a great collector uh, uh, of people. Uh, if you can't do it alone, find somebody else to do it with, or find, or, or get three people and do it with three people and start something. Mm -hmm. What's to, what's to stop you? It's not money. <laughs> You'll make money. You will mm -hmm. always make money. But you've got to start with with get an idea and do it and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Well. Danny, you have the last word. Good, I, I like <laughs> the last word. She always said to me when I moved to New World that uh, she had to fight puritism her whole life. Mm -hmm. That's true. And she said, I was gonna have to fight the dollar. 
And she said, you're going to have to figure out how to go in the back door and get around that dollar and make things happen. Mm -hmm. I, I now tell my students about what a great woman she was and a visionary and that you could be creative and not choreograph. You could be a creative director. Mm -hmm. And the one word that I always think of when I think of Martha is a, a director. She was someone that directed things. And I always, I, mean, I wrote down a quote that I really loved that I wrote many years ago about Martha. I said, even now, I know she's in the heavens somewhere directing the stars and the planets and changing the course of the cosmos for us forever. She's still working because she's working through all the students she taught. Mm -hmm. They're carrying on her traditions to make sure that dance has a voice and a wonderful way of communicating with people. And we were very, we, I talk about the three of us right now, we're very lucky to be under her wing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. So, ladies and gents on my panel, thank you so much for joining us. This has really been wonderful and just what I think we all wanted to hear, these personal remembrances and reminiscences of the marvelous Miss Hill. And to all of you that tuned in, I'm afraid we've run out of time. And thank you so much for joining us and tuned in and hear about this remarkable woman. Please have a look at future events of the Martha Hill Dance Fund on our website, marthahilldance.org. That's one word, marthahilldance.org. And we thank you all and thank you for tuning in. And well, hopefully we're going to meet in person again soon. Yes. So, yes. Yes. yes, right? Yes. yes. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alan. Good night to all. Thank good you, night. Alan. Thank good you, night. Janet. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, guys.